Nations. And football is the subject here on BBC Scotland now. In a change to the published programme, a Focal Point special considers the plight of Hibernian Football Club, currently under offer and with bids closing next Wednesday. Hibs, out of its league, discloses how the club crashed and how club boss David Duff was merely a puppet, controlled by an offshore financier. The Hibernian football boss who led his team to the brink of financial disaster claims today he was just a puppet. An offshore financier, he says, pulled the strings. But 18 months ago, as he rode high on fans' acclaim, David Duff scarcely bothered to conceal his self-satisfaction at how he came to buy the club he followed. Most people don't understand how you can acquire, um, A, a famous football club, and then B, turn it into a strong company with merely £100,000 capital. I mean, a lot of intelligent people have said, how on earth did you do that? Today, poorer by a million pounds and ousted without glory from his prestige post, David Duff has suffered a learning experience. I can sometimes hardly believe how naive I was not to see some of the things that other people saw and told me about. Wine bars in the West Country bought by the Edinburgh Club racked up a weekly loss of £80,000. The way ahead for Hibs became an albatross. Now the receivers are in and going through the wreckage, a for sale sign posted over the park. But with only shabby assets and debts of millions, who will buy the club that played in a high-powered fast financial league, didn't know the rules and lost? Tonight, Focal Point reveals the deals, the secret maneuverings and the off-park play that led to Hibernian scoring an own goal. the heartland of Hibernian support, is today a football community that is poorer, sadder, but so far none the wiser as to why their team, Hibernian FC, the boys in green, faces the prospect of being kicked into touch after a thrashing from a Super League team which claimed just 18 months ago to be leading the way to a football nirvana. The architect of that scheme, then lord of all he surveyed, Hibs fan and Swindon solicitor David Duff, reveals how he sought to play with the big boys and had the ball snatched from under his nose. The people involved are way up in my league. They're um, uh, um, definite first division business players. You're out of your class? Oh, out of my... I mean, I, I, I've no doubt about that. Out of my class in terms of... Not just in, uh, not just in terms of ability, but in terms of power and in terms of um, what people can do to get things done. <laughs> Hibbs present crisis started, somewhat bizarrely, some 400 miles south of the Easter Road football park. In the architectural gem of Bath, Hibbs purchased Avon Inns, a string of wine bar watering holes for the trendy and moneyed, an investment, according to David Duff, that would pour frothing profits for the benefit of Hibbs and its fans. But from whom did David Duff buy them? Inoko is the principal business vehicle of Monaco-based financier David Rowland, who bankrolled Duff to buy Hibbs. A subsidiary company, controlled by Roland, was finding it had made a financial miscalculation on Avon Inns, and they were sold to Duff. The Inns were losing £80,000 a week, and David Duff, on behalf of Hibbs, did not want to buy. But he did. Why? I would rather say that I don't think we really had a lot of choice. Um, when we went into Avon Inns, we went in with a lot of hope, as you know, and um, we continued to work very hard at it. Really what happened was that you had a situation where um, the, the deal was introduced to us by the major shareholder who had representation on the board. Um, and therefore, we had to uh, go along with their view on what this might be able to do for the company. I genuinely believe that they hoped, like the rest of us, 
uh, that it would be a successful acquisition. Um, so it's not a case of free will, it's a case of that's the people that were in the company, uh, and, um, and we went along with them. Roland pulled the strings? Um, <laughs> to a certain extent, yes. And you were the puppet? Um, I suppose in some ways I was a puppet, yes. What, in effect, did the acquisition of Evelyn's do for Hibbs? Ultimately, it's, it's probably the, the, the largest thing that's been responsible for the current receivership. Um, there are other factors, but ultimately it hasn't worked. As far back as January last year, the board of Fabernian, according to Duff, realised they were just not trucking at Avon Inns, today worth perhaps only half the £6 million paid for them. But that problem paled into insignificance when, in early summer last year, Roland, in total secrecy, looked to protect his own shareholding in a financially failing Hibs. Out of the blue, it was announced that a predator was seeking control of David Duff's football empire, Hibernian. David Roland had phoned me up and asked me to come in. And he had told me on that Thursday that somebody was bidding for the company. Curiously, or I thought curiously at the time, he wouldn't tell me who. He told me I would find out. The reason that he, that he gave me for not telling me who was that he, he wasn't sure that the bid would, would come in. So it's obvious that at that time they were still arranging and putting the thing together. So he wouldn't tell me who. Um, he did tell me the approximate price that it would be, and he told me that the bidder would be somebody that would want to work with me. Um, so I wasn't really alerted um, to the major uh, personal ramifications which were about to happen. On the Thursday, uh, on Friday, I spoke to um, my co-directors, Jim Gray and Alan Munro, and we spent the weekend speculating on who this bidder might be. Who did you think it might be? We thought at one point that it was Robert Maxwell. We'd sat down uh, in Alan's house and we came to the conclusion that it, that it might be Robert Maxwell. The newspaper publisher? Yes. And multi-millionaire? Yes. I, I know it's, it's a curious thing to think, but the way we'd been told about the bid, the mere fact that they wouldn't tell us who it was made us think that it must have been someone fairly unique uh, and or someone that we might not want. Not that I wouldn't want Robert Maxwell, but he would have been um, a target of somebody they might not want to tell us about as a man interested in football. And it could have been him. So we, we'd come to that conclusion. But however, on the Sunday, so we only had a couple, 48 hours to speculate, on the Sunday we were invited, if that's the right word, down to a board meeting. Does that mean you were told to go to a board Well, yes. Um, and we knew why, because the, 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 we were going to be told who was bidding for the company. And we were invited down on the Sunday. To London. To London. We didn't know that the bid was going to be announced on the Monday. We just merely knew that there was a board meeting to discuss a potential bid on the company. So Jim, Allen, and myself hopped on the plane and found ourselves at uh, the headquarters of Anoko for a board meeting. Um, in fact, we went into the reception, and I was invited to come upstairs to the flat, which is at the top of the building, where Jeremy James and David Rowland were already installed. And it was this is exactly how it was introduced to me. Jeremy turned around and said, David, who is the worst person you could imagine that would, be, that would bid for the company? And I speculated a few names that I won't repeat, uh, but not the right one. And Jeremy kept saying, no, worse than that, worse than that, the very worst person. It's quite funny. Uh, David Duff thought that it was Bob Maxwell that was sitting downstairs. And I didn't want to delude him, but Bob Maxwell, if he's going to buy a club, will buy Manchester United, not Hibs Football Club. And I think there was a degree of shock when I walked in and was introduced to him. I think everyone would admit it was slightly radical. I think they came up with a whole stack of names that could be. But the one name they didn't come up with was Hearts Football Club. So apart from anything else, it was a good spoof. I mean, I do find uh, I've, I've had a lot of enjoyment out of it. It really has been great fun. Hibs fans were thunderstruck. Easter Road was under siege. I would like to confirm that this morning, Art of Midlothian PLC submitted an offer um, for the full issued share capital of Edinburgh Hibernian PLC. But how dare Wallace Mercer seek to put himself in their director's box? Well, I was phoned one Sunday night about 8 o'clock by a director of Edinburgh Hibernian and said, would you believe there has been a takeover bid for the club? To which I replied, yes. Well, I'm not entirely surprised. 
said, but I bet you won't believe whom it's from. I said, well, tell me. He said, it's from Wallace Mercer. Now that I found strange, bordering on the unbelievable. How on earth someone whose life has been dedicated to a heart of Midlothian could think of eliminating his competition in such a manner uh, was something I, I initially could not take in. I'm not a Johnny come lately who's an opportunist who's maybe making money out of it over a year or so, and I would make a distinction between the two elements in the business. Um, we are committed to continuing and improving the football image of Edinburgh and Melodians. The whole rationale behind that was, was that we thought there would be some merit in putting the two businesses together. But none of us were prepared to consider that night uh, the, the, the losing of the independence of Hibs. That was the dearest thing to our hearts, and that was the thing that, 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 that the first thing that you thought of was, this means the end of Hibs. So none of us believed in an Edinburgh United, but there may have been things in Wallace's plans that we could have latched onto and discussed, and you know, perhaps a stadium where both Hibs and Hearts play, even if that's corporately owned jointly by both companies, or even if it's owned by Wallace. With hindsight, do you wish you had listened perhaps more attentively? No, because it really wasn't like that. What we were told was, there was the offer letter, it had been accepted, there was a stock exchange to announce it the next day, and would I, Mr Duff, like to stand on the platform for Wallace Mercer and tell the Edinburgh public that Hibs were dead? That's really how it was presented. I, I mean, at the board meeting, I asked questions because we, they were talking about an Edinburgh United, and it became very clear that the Edinburgh United of the next season was going to be playing at Tyne Castle in maroon jerseys and was going to be called Hard to Midlothian. That was, very, that was made very clear, but that somewhere along the line um, there would be an Edinburgh United. And up with that you would not put? Up with that I could not and would not put. And up with that, I mean, that, that, that was the catalyst of a very large personal sacrifice for me um, because not only was I going to sacrifice um, my own credibility, not only was I going to sacrifice my own position at the Hibs Football Club, which you know was very dear to me, but I was also going to potentially lose a very large amount of money. But up with that, as you say, I could not put. Reviled by the fans for failing to deliver on his promises, David Duff was now nonetheless the hero of the hour. Pressed by Roland, pursued by Mercer, aware that he was now yesterday's man at Hibs, David Duff refused to sell his shares. Hibs, he said, came first. Hibs supporters threw their weight into a hands-off Hibs campaign. Wallace Mercer and Hearts had to be seen off. At the park, it was green all the way. It was to be the biggest match of the fans' life. Easter Road was roused, under threat, and there was but one message for Wallace Mercer. Keep your credit and hands off the Berlin football club. Easter Road became a hornet's nest. Each and every fan became an activist, including those who bought shares when Duff took the club public. They and Duff determined to thwart the Roland Mercer deal, which would have got the financier out of Hibs and the Hearts boss into the boardroom. Wallace Mercer, now a very public target and shaken by the strength of Hibs opposition, found his takeover bid on a downward slope and withdrew his offer. I'm obviously delighted. Uh, we said from the beginning that we thought there was a hostile bid that it wasn't acceptable on financial grounds or on social or cultural grounds. Um, I'm delighted that Wallace has had the good grace. He had a vision. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. There's no reason why somebody shouldn't follow what they think is right. And I'm delighted he's had the good grace to see now that it's not what Hibs want, it's not what Hearts want, it's not what Edinburgh wants. And um, I wish him all the luck and all the best in the future. Which was just one problem dealt with. David Duff, who had at last stood against Roland and said no, thwarted the deal and cost the financier money, brought down on his head the wrath of the man from Monaco. He was very, very cross with me, very angry with me. He believed that um, I was um, being very foolish in not um, accepting the bid. Uh, he told me at the time, uh, and I have to say that uh, he was right. He said, you'll get no thanks for the sacrifice you're making, uh, and what will happen is that you'll get blamed for everything. Uh, and therefore, you know, this is a stupid attitude, a stupid pose that you're taking in terms of um, 
not accepting this or, in his word, frustrating the bid. Um, and I have to say that a lot of what he predicted came true. You knew that night that your card was marked if you didn't go along with the scheme. You better believe it. You better believe it. I had to make a decision to go against my partner. Your funder. My funder. Your puppet master. If you like. At which point there was being played at Easter Road an entirely new game with a new team lined up in the boardroom. Duff was no longer supremo and a number of Edinburgh businessmen evinced an interest in a battered but so far unbowed Hibernian. The new board set about splitting the business into three parts, the football club, the business administration called Fourth Investments, and that bit of bad news in the West Country, Avon Inns. According to David Duff, these were hopeful days, although he says no one listened to him anymore. So who was being listened to? Who was looking after the fans? I think that the, uh, as far as people like myself, who are business people are concerned, is that we also recognise that we have responsibility to the community. Uh, and probably 85% of people in Edinburgh would agree that the Hibernian Football Club shouldn't disappear. And these 85%, for most of them, if they express that thought, then it will not get reported in the media. But if somebody like Tom Farmer does, then possibly people will listen. I, uh, also, to show my commitment to do that, I acquired a hold in the Bernie Football Club. Uh, myself and a colleague, now we control some 9% of the club. They, uh, and the reason that we have those shares in the club is only so as our voice is heard. Tom helped, um, helped us, uh, or helped me, uh, during the bid because we were all looking for a solution to the problem. And Tom, obviously, being an Edinburgh businessman and being a man um, who, who comes from Leith, um, I don't think, I think he'd be the first one to tell you that he's not a hip supporter. He's not really interested in football as an entertainment, as a game. But I think he felt that he wanted to do something to help the situation. I believe that he's part of the Edinburgh, uh, well, the Edinburgh syndicate that's looking to buy the football club, was looking to buy the football club before receivership of the parent company and is still negotiating to buy it. Um, and I believe that um, there's possibly a big, that, that there's possibly a, a liking to follow the scenario that I've just said, some, some coming together of the two clubs, keeping their independence, um, but perhaps playing at a new built stadium funded partly by the Bank of Scotland and partly by the two football clubs. I don't know. I'm not privy to the actual um, details, but I believe that that big stadium development play has been here from the beginning and will eventually come to its fruition. I mean, you remember the first time you ever interviewed me uh, that I told you, I said to you then, that I believe that Hibs, the Hibs site was on a piece of land which was prime for development because of what was around it. And my view of that hasn't changed. But you believe that others will pick up the action? Oh, yes. Yes. And who are they? Well, we shall see. There's lots of curiosities in, 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 in the whole big picture, if you like. Um, we shall see, but I don't think uh, there'll be many names that haven't at some time appeared in the story. Intriguing stuff indeed. And what of the Hibs asset in the shape of land beside the stadium that might, suggests David Duff, be developed to the tune of millions of pounds? It lies, derelict, only a mile from the east end of the city centre, where Hibs defunct or banished in whatever form to pastures new, though not necessarily green, it could well be worth the interest of businessmen with a good eye for a deal. Bookmaker Kenny Walk, he sold Hibs to Duff for £800,000 just four years ago, is in the running to buy it back. Recently, just yards and minutes ahead of the receivers going in, Wach offered to buy Hibs for a sum around four and a half million pounds. The Wach bid was something slightly different. That was not a bid for the company. That was a bid for the football company. So that was, if you like, um, it wasn't a bid uh, in, an, uh, in what we'd understand as a city bid. It was an offer to purchase from the company 
the football club and its assets. So it didn't amount to a bid. Did it strike you as odd that here was a man who some two years prior had sold you the club for £800,000, everything that it then had, lock, stock and barrel. And here he is two years later offering £4 million to buy a portion of that back with the great debts and difficulties attached there too. Well, uh, firstly, nothing about him surprises me now. It's been a long, long, hard year and nothing surprises me. Not much now surprises Hibs fans either. Managements come and go, but the crisis only deepens. Just what game is being played on the park and what are the rules, if any? David Duff casts his mind back to what he thinks may be the future. He remembers Wallace Mercer's plan for a super stadium on the city outskirts, a scheme that would lift Edinburgh football into the front line in Europe as far as facilities are concerned. But who would finance it? Enter Rangers, David Murray. David uh, Murray has a company, I think, with the Bank of Scotland. And the BS is the Bank of Scotland. And they were the funders. Uh, they were going to be the funders of that, um, that particular site. Pure speculation, my view is that there will be a joint stadium and that um, the Bank of Scotland somewhere will be involved in the funding of it. Um, so the scenario will probably come out um, to the point that perhaps the main players in the game always wanted it to come out to. Um, it's just a shame that we had to go through the bid and all the hassle uh, to get to that point. Do you feel that you were at all times sidelined by these major players? Yes. David Duff, out of his league and out of his depth, Hibbs fan from his youth and would-be football entrepreneur, today surveys the ashes of his dream, a disappointed and puzzled man. One of the things he does not understand is the role of the Bank of Scotland when Hibbs were endeavouring to fend off a bid from Heart of Midlothian. I think it's common knowledge that the Bank of Scotland were the, were the funders or the potential funders um, for hearts in the takeover. And it's common knowledge too that the Bank of Scotland supported us and indeed advanced us more money um, in order to see that bid off. Perhaps a commercial decision um, made by the bank, but a curious, um, a curious scenario when both horses are backed. Even-handed banking? Yeah, I think to be fair, the Chinese walls worked well. I mean, we, we, the curious thing, it was all dealt with not just by the Bank of Scotland, but from one office in the Bank of Scotland, or one building in the Bank of Scotland. The Beria House? Yes, and I think, the, I think it's fair to say we certainly learned nothing of what hearts were doing from the Bank of Scotland during the bid, and it's my honest belief that they learned nothing of what we were doing. So I think it was even hand. My only, what I would say is unfortunate that both clubs had this great expenditure, which ultimately is funded by the Bank of Scotland, to the point where somewhere else down the line the Bank of Scotland find that they put in a receiver. I mean, it, 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 you know, it's not a criticism, but sometimes I scratch my head. Do you feel you've been sold down the road? I feel that I've been completely so down the road and on all sides. I mean, I, it's been a no-win situation. But having said that, I was the guy that put my head on the block. And I knew that when I went into Hibs um, that uh, I would have been prepared to take the credit if everything had worked out, and it might have done. And therefore, a lot of people will, will say that I deserve what I got. Um, at the end of the day, I know the sacrifices I made. There's no point in me being bitter about them. I came to Hibs with a, with a clean heart, and I leave it with a clean heart, and Hibs will go on. It's very sad for me personally, and very costly, but at the end of the day, it might have worked out differently. If it worked out differently, I'd have been happy to take the credit. But there's no credit for the taking in the east end of Edinburgh, where Hibs finds its support. Today, the receivers are working out what may be made from the wreckage of a once proud club, a club that, pre-David Duff, played football and did not think of wine bars in the West Country. Only the football part of the business is not in the hands of the receivers. Bids for it may be in by the end of next week. Kenny Walk is interested. Tom Farmer is said to be on the starting grid. He would probably say, just in case. And 
there could be others. With Hibs player and Scotland goalkeeper Andy Gorham recently sold to David Murray's Rangers FC for a million pounds, the club's remaining assets should not cost dear. Does Wallace Mercer believe in a deeper game? Well, there's no doubt about that. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I'm not going to squander shareholders' funds just because we want to buy Hibs. Can I tell you that is not particularly relevant to me? That doesn't particularly bother me. What I'm interested in about is establishing hearts as the clearly defined big playing side from Edinburgh and the Lothians. I mean, why get involved in all this aggravation? There must be an answer, and that's for you to find out and for us to guess about. Would you play poker with me? Two things I've never wanted to do in my life. One is I do not want to be a politician, and the other thing I don't really want to do is I do not want to own a football club. But I believe that a football club is a very, very important part of the community. And a club like the Berlin Football Club has been going for well over 100 years. And I think it's wrong that uh, anyone or any organisation should try to put themselves in a position where they remove such an important part of the community life. I think there's all sorts of business people involved in this football club, which um, I just scratch my head at. I think really what Hibs fans now is they just want to go back to playing football. Do you regret the day you first approached David Rowland and said, look, what about 800,000 to buy Hibs? Absolutely. Um, from my own point of view, I wish that none of it had ever happened. What does it cost you? There's a, there's a huge price in all sorts of things. I mean, there's the financial sacrifice, which is one thing, and a big thing. How uh, much? Perhaps a million pounds. There's also um, a great deal of personal, of other things that, that, that you can't equate with money, a learning curve that really I would prefer not to have gone round. And what have you learned about the Edinburgh business scene? that it is finely meshed and smoothly moving? I don't really want to sound like a bitter person because it would be hypocritical for me now to say I regret or I'm bitter about this, that and the next thing when all I've ever said is that I'm interested in Hibs and Hibs will be okay. So I don't really want to come over in that bitter way but I do find it, I do find that perhaps in the world or in a certain amount of Edinburgh business there's a hell of a deviousness about I just went away from it now. Very briefly, if there's one lesson you learned, in a few words, what is it? In a few words, um, I suppose the biggest lesson is that you can't really trust anyone.